square root of 22s. So that became my working formula as I was developing overlays to display on this large map. H is the ice thickness and S is, S is the distance you are from the ice margin. Everything measured in the metric system. And that curve kind of describes the rate of thickness of ice sheets when you're dealing with the edge of the ice sheet or uh, a small distance in from the edge of the ice sheet. And that's really what I needed to project the margin of the ice sheet in our landscape. So my visualization project with this poster board map began. I used the US Geological Survey topographic quadrangles as the base map. And that's what you see in the frame leaning over there um, on the right hand side of the hall here tonight. So I mounted them side by side on foam core, closed them in that wooden frame. It does have a piano hinge so it collapses down which makes it a little bit easier to carry especially if you have 34 inch sleeves, which I do, so I can carry that pretty easily. Then I used clear acetate overlays on top of that map. And what I could do with, with non-permanent marker, non-permanent being the key adjective there, non-permanent marker, I could draw in um, representative contour lines from the margin of the ice sheet uh, up some distance from the edge using that modeling formula, that graph that you saw. I actually have a copy of that graph. It's on graph paper. It's about this long, which is about how much I, I put onto the maps. Um, and it was really a pretty, pretty cool technique. You ignore all of the post-glacial gully erosion that took place, so you don't have to be too concerned about things that have happened in the last 10,000 years. You just kind of visualize. Uh, 12,000 years ago, 13,000 years ago, what did it look like? And I picked certain points to start because I knew where the lake outlets were. And I wanted to make sure I captured Glacial Lake Naples, the first and oldest of the pro-glacial lakes that we'll talk about today, and where its outlet was down in uh, Cohocton. And then Glacial Lake Middlesex, whose outlet was up in Potter, New York. Okay, so I made sure I got my ice margin south of that Glacial Lake Middlesex outlet so I could demonstrate the fullest extent of Glacial Lake Naples. And then as the margin retreats, oh, lower drainage point up there on East Hill, it's on the top of the hill, but it's still the lowest drainage point. It's almost 200 feet lower than down in Cohocton and everything starts to move east instead of south through Cohocton. So we're gonna look at Pro-Glacial Lake Naples and Pro-Glacial Lake Middlesex. Non-permanent marker on the top of the clear acetate and then I flipped it over and put color transparency film and contour lines all on the bottom so it was protected and would wear forever. And these maps are now about uh, 45 years old, these, over, these overlays, so they've, they've lasted pretty well. Of course, we could look at some of the more modern technology that's used. This is one of the valleys east of us, showing uh, the valley in the lower part of the image, the Valley Heads Moraine, that bumpy, hilly moraine, and then an outwash area where the lake outlet would have been to the south. And this is over by Ithaca, New York, that particular valley. But it could very well have been the Canadagua Valley. It would have the same appearance to it. So the smooth outwash, if we look for that in the Canadagua Valley, we have to get south of the Valley Heads Moraine. So there it is, um, right down near North Cohocton, and very flat, smooth outwash, shallow lake bottom area. Travel a little bit farther south along Route um, 415, along 415, almost to Cohocton, and that broad area narrows down to a lake outlet channel and then there's a lot of sandy gravelly deposits right there at Cohocton. So the story's there if we know how to read the evidence. Fairchild taught me how to read that evidence. Going down that valley towards Cohocton, you can see on this hillside, see if I can get this to show, 
Where's that laser? Well, there it is. Right there is the abandoned beach, about 20 feet up. And this is all shallow, sandy beach deposits just down into Glacial Lake Naples. Um, pretty cool. The farmers know where these sand layers are because they use it so much. And we know now where those sand layers are and we can interpret that geologic history. I just happened to be down at the DEC maintenance building on Route 245, just as you come into Naples, right by Naples Creek, uh, Finger Lakes Trail, section of it works along there. I looked back to the east on the hillside, and it was late springtime. There was a little bit of snow. It had mostly melted off the sloping hillside, but where there were terraces on the hillside, it had not melted off. The snow had built up a little bit deeper, a little bit flatter landscape, didn't get the same solar radiation on it to cause melting. For that moment in time, it revealed where those abandoned shorelines were on that hillside just east of Naples, New York. It lasted for about a day, and then it got warm enough that all the snow was gone and you didn't see the pattern. But if we're there at the right time, we look, we notice these things, we're good observers. And that's me uh, pointing out on a topographic map. This is uh, Middlesex coming over towards Potter. So that's on the summit of East Hill. There's this strange gully on the top of the hill. Oh, wait a minute, all the gullies are down towards the lake. Why is there a gully at the top of the hill? What caused that? Ah, it's a lake outlet. And if the water was flowing, from here to there, and there should be a very large delta deposit where that lake outlet water carrying all of its sediment load slowed down as it hit the Flint Creek Valley in Potter. And sure enough, there's a huge gravel pit operation right there. About three years ago, I was reading some older Fairchild documents that I had not previously seen. And Fairchild actually stopped here I think he was up on Friend Road looking back to the northwest uh, towards Potter. And he said, oh my God, there's a kettle hole depression in the middle of that delta deposit. There was a large block of ice that got trapped there for a short time period. Sediment built up around it, and then the block of ice melted out, and you still have that hollow there. And it's still there today. I had to go check it out. <coughs> had to do some traipsing which is short for trespassing. <laughs> <clears throat> so this is, that, uh, this is that lake outlet. And conveniently, the easiest place to cross the top of East Hill would be this low elevation lake outlet. And that's exactly what Route 364 does as it travels from Middlesex over to Potter. It's right in the bottom of the lake outlet. It's about 60 feet deep. It's about 200 feet wide. So that was a considerable river that was draining Glacial Lake Middlesex eastward into the Flint Creek area, Italy Valley area, I guess we call that, Potter Swamp, that area. So for comparison, our modern Canandaigua Lake, uh, surface elevation 687 feet. Glacial Lake Naples, we'll look at it in a moment in my first overlay. The surface elevation is 1,340 feet. We know that because we know the elevation of the outlet at Cohocton. Uh, Kendag Lake, 276 feet deep. Probably Glacial Lake Naples was more than 800 feet deep. It's hard to know how much sedimentation would have occurred in the lake at that time. Uh, modern day Kendag Lake, 15 and a half miles long. Glacier Lake Naples probably only about 13 miles long at its longest point, but it was wider and it was a little more convoluted because the level of the lake was so high it could flood some of the adjacent valleys as well. Canandaigua Lake drains north, the outlet here at the north end. Uh, lake Naples drains south at Cohocton into an ancestral Cohocton River, Shemung River, eventually Susquehanna and Chesapeake Bay. The other lake we're going to look at is 
uh, glycolytic metal sacs. So all I did was change the data there on the right-hand side. So it's uh, a little bit lower uh, surface elevation, uh, 190 feet lower, if I remember correctly, 1,150 feet lower, or 50 feet compared to 1,340. Uh, Probably not quite as deep because the surface elevation has dropped. Probably about 10 miles long, three miles wide, and it drained east into the Italy Valley, Flint Creek, Potter Swamp area. You know, that must have been catastrophic. I mean, you're watching the ice margin retreat, and suddenly it finds this lower spot on the crest of East Hill down there outside of Middlesex, and that lake drops almost 200 feet. Imagine the volume and velocity of that water as it shot through that break in the top of the hill and over into Potter to deposit that delta deposit, all that gravel over there. You look at that uh, gravel pit today, and the tabular rocks are stacked up like playing cards, all pointing eastward uh, in that deposit. And there are rocks that probably weigh several tons that were moved by this flow of water, just that massive velocity. So we're going to switch over to some glacial lake overlays. And as I tell my students, poster maps rule. And this is where you really get to visualize what's going on. So I'm going to leave the microphone for a moment, climb up the ladder, put my first overlay on, then I'll get back here and talk about some of these features. Not the man behind the curtain. Behind the curtain, yes. <laughs> I gotta get this up. In the classroom, we had this wall mounted, so you could appreciate it. You get the two tallest volunteers in the class to uh, kind of set things up there. So I put the uh, ice margin uh, just south of Middlesex on the eastern side, the right-hand side of the map. The ice is represented there in, in white with black contour lines. Um, so we can see tongues of ice that extended down the valleys. And between them, the hilltops were high enough that they extended up above the ice margin. So it's a, it's a lobate ice margin. It's not a, a straight ice margin. Blue represents water bodies. And there's a little uh, hashing underneath the blue that represents major delta deposits. So that one skinny lake to the far right, that's Glacial Lake Italy. Over in the Italy Valley, it stood at 1,370 feet above sea level, 30 feet higher than Glacial Lake Naples, which is that big one in the center of the lake. Glacial Lake Italy drained into Glacial Lake Naples. Right along Route 53, there's some uh, excellent gravel pits just outside of Naples, New York. I think they're abandoned now. Uh, but that's where Glacial Lake Italy drained into Glacial Lake Naples and left all the gravel gravel behind. You'll notice that the, uh, there's an arm of Glacial Lake Naples that extends up the Bristol Valley, kind of towards the center of the map. Let's see if the laser light works here. I gotta get myself here. Okay, there's my dot. Okay, right there. Dr. Gelman. That's in the Bristol Valley right there. The laser doesn't show up on the recording at all, so if you wanna take the microphone and go over there and gesture, it might be better for the permanent record. Take the uh, clip on one? Yeah, just clip it. To okay. Yourself. Don't forget to take the part that's sitting on the... Unit. Yes. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd take the whole stand with me, Bill, and that wouldn't be good. <laughs> okay. I'll put that in my pocket. How's that sound? That sounds great. Just don't let me walk out with it. No, no. I'll okay. 
and you still have my sound back there. Good. So here's the Bristol Valley. So there was an arm of Glacier Lake Naples that extended up the Bristol Valley. Uh, here's the high elevation Gulick Valley where Cummings Nature Center is located. Too high elevation, wouldn't have been uh, a finger, uh, an embayment in Glacier Lake Naples. Sits too high. But there would have been drainage of meltwater from the ice margin down through the Gulick Valley that creates a delta deposit where it enters Glacial Lake Naples. Oh, excuse me, that's the Honeyway Valley right there, right? Yes, the Honeyway Valley, Bristol Valley, Gulick Valley. Tongues of ice coming down the valleys. And this is over at Canada Ice and uh, Hemlock on the far uh, left-hand side of this particular map. So everything's draining southward. There's the drainage at Cohocton. Way down there at the very, very base of that map, the drainage at Cohocton. This would have been coming in from spring water and looping down into that Cohocton drainage. Bill, I'm glad you're up here. I'm not talking loud enough? You're, you have a very peaceful voice, but it doesn't project as loud as you think. Do you want this one back? No, no, no. We need Stay that one, too. OK. Yeah. OK. Go ahead. You've got plenty of slack. OK. So all I'm going to do now is let the ice margin melt back, maybe 200 years' time, 300 years' time. So I'm going to get the ice margin up here around the middle of the map. And we're going to uncover that lower outlet channel in Middlesex, New York. So this outlet at Cohocta, down at the bottom of the map, will be abandoned. It's going to drop 190 feet in surface elevation. Things are going to change. We'll still have the ice on here. This is all ice, too, by the way. Just low budget. Didn't have all the white <laughs> transparency film to, to cover all that white in the background. This is where the action is, anyway right along the ice margin. Imagine icebergs drifting in this too, drop stones going down to the varves at the bottom. All that was taking place. So I'm gonna roll this one up and then put the Glacial Lake Middlesex one on, okay? Everybody good with that? Let's see if I can do that without falling off a ladder or anything. <laughs> Perfect. You got it. They're very durable. This is how they do thunder in the movies. Thank you, Bill. Mm -hmm. Switch out. Change it. Sure. I'm back. <laughs> almost feel like you have to say, here's Johnny, you know? <laughs> you good? Mm -hmm. Wow, look what happened. I didn't order enough blue transparency film to color in the lakes over here, you know? <laughs> Best laid plans, you think you've got enough supplies and, oh, missing a little bit. But that's just hemlock and Canada ice. <laughs> okay, so it was formerly draining way down here at Cohocton, but now that surface elevation of that lake has dropped 190 feet, and the outlet's right here, right there. South Hill and Bear Hill are islands in this lake, the summit of those hills. This is Glacial Lake Bristol. This is the Bristol Valley. 
Stands up Connie Road 30, 32, 32, 33, 33. This is 32 going this way, right? 33. 33 and then this way, yep. It extends up that a little bit, drains down into Glacial Lake Middlesex at Bristol Springs. There's a huge gravel pit there as well, right where it drains in. Glacial Lake Honeyoy at its probably its largest extent. Uh, down here, past Maxfield Road, again, big gravel pits right there. Town of Naples gravel pit, I think Kula Brothers gravel pits down in there as well. Um, yeah, all this interesting drainage. Uh, Marty, just for you, there's a little meltwater escape channel, a high flow channel right at Wolf Gull, which I think you know pretty well, which is located right here. Can I ask a question? You sure can. Um, there are two very prominent terraces down South Hill. Uh, we live over on this side. Mm -hmm. And I would guess they're probably around this elevation. Right. And I've wondered for a long time if those were wave cuts. Probably. Thank you. Yep. Can you repeat the question, Bruce? Uh, he lives there on uh, the... On Bapa Hill Road. Oh, on Bapa Hill Road over here on this side. Okay. And has seen wave cut terraces. That's what I assume. Right? Yeah. I think even when you're, <clears throat> when you're here at uh, Bristol Springs, you think about uh, what's the road that goes down to... Um, Fisher Point, is it? Stemple Hill? Stemple Hill, yeah. yeah there's, there's, that road is all loose gravel. That's why they're always shoring it up. You, know, you go on some of these roads that are along the gullies going down to the lake and it's all shale. And you can see all the bedrock outcrop. That one's all sand and gravel. And it slips and slides and they're always rebuilding it and putting up temporary Jersey barriers. And it's all by the nature of that glacial deposit that's there just south of uh, Bristol, Bristol Springs, because it's all in that big delta deposit. You notice there's a little mound right here too, mm -hmm. which I uh, kind of indicate as a small island. Eh, I don't know. <clears throat> I think what happened, that's where I live, by the way, is right there on that small island. And I garden. It's, it's supposed to be a vegetable garden, but it's more of a rock garden, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, I think what happened when that uh, channel was abandoned that went over to Naples, or excuse me, over to Potter, and then as the ice margin retreated, there were uh, lower places to drain farther to the north. So that channel was abandoned. I think there may have been a short time period of reverse flow in that channel, and it came back and it just formed a little tiny little de deltaic mound and I live on the summit of that mound. I pay the price. I do have a rock floor two feet thick though in my entire barn. It's been picked, hand picked out of the garden so it's a lot of rocks there. And I know it's a long ways down the bedrock having drilled a well on that property as well. So we, we have information to maybe make that a a good interpretation of what happened there. That roadway, uh, 364 from Middlesex to Potter, when you're in that roadway, uh, the local folks call that Robber's Gulch. And about halfway down that roadway, you will see a small waterfall that drops in on the south side. And it's a tiny little stream. And you look at the dimensions, the dimensions of that channel could not have been built by that tiny little stream drainage that's there. Uh, had to have been something much more massive to have excavated all that rock out of there. And it's, it's a lot of bare rock exposure when you, you look at that cut that the road sits in at that point on the landscape. So you all now get to get your marker pens and your paper out. One through ten will be the Olympic scoring method we'll be using for this visualization process. And, uh, or, or just that will work too. Is there a question? And I will take any questions you might have. I'll just kind of stay up here at the podium.
Prussians know, yes. I have a question about the terrace, the terraces that were lake shores. Yes, wave cut terraces on the hillside. Terraces. Why were why were there why were they so far apart? As opposed to more frequent, if it because uh, over geologic time, you think there'd be more. So, so the previous map with Glacier Lake Naples on there, it would have started out as a very small lake, and then as the margin retreated, it elongated and elongated. There wasn't any other place for the water to escape, so it was in existence for some length of time, which allowed that wave action to cut that terrace on the hillside, and then suddenly it gets to Middlesex, and oh. There's a better spot to drain. It's 190 feet lower in elevation, and that lake level drops. It abandons that that old beach. They call them strand lines because they're stranded above the modern lake level in the valley. And, and then that one gets built into the landscape for whatever length of time that lake is actually in existence until a yet lower down outlet is uncovered as the margin continues.